delivered as part of the Brabazon Committee, the airspeed ambassador was a model rendered obsolete by its very conception, as this heir apparent to the famous Douglas DC-3 was superseded by its own stablemate in the Brabazon scheme, the Vickers Viscount, and would thus be forced into a seldom-remembered career despite delivering one of the few dedicated first-class-only domestic operations in Europe. The Brabazon Committee had been undertaken during the midst of World War II, and was a far-sighted initiative to deliver civilian airliners for the eventual peace in Europe, with each of the proposals of the committee being developed to meet various individual market sectors. What would become the Ambassador fell under the designation Type II, which called for a Douglas DC-3 replacement and among the manufacturers invited to submit proposals was the Airspeed Company, which had been formed in 1931 by two former airship engineers, A. Hassel Tiltman and N.S. Norway, the latter of whom would become better known as Neville Shute, the best-selling novelist. Airspeed was known for building wooden aircraft like the Oxford Trainer and the Horsa troop-carrying glider, but had little experience of metal construction, though upon the firm becoming a wholly owned subsidiary of de Havilland in 1940, this not only increased its credibility, but also brought the production facilities at Christchurch and Portsmouth, together with a new chief engineer, Arthur Hagg. Hagg had made a name for himself during the 1930s, creating aerodynamically advanced aircraft like the de Havilland DH-88 Comet Air Racer and the DH-91 Albatross Airliner, and initially created an early concept that was powered by two Bristol Hercules engines, but lacked a pressurised passenger cabin, this model not offering much beyond the DC-3, and was thus scrapped before leaving the drawing board. Hag's next design, the AS-57, would use two of Bristol's powerful Centaurus radials, and an all-metal airframe with a near-circular fuselage cross-section, the high-mounted wing not only meaning an aerodynamically clean top surface, but also a low fuselage floor, good downward vision for passengers, and sufficient clearance for the propellers. By the end of 1944, a cabin mock-up had been delivered, with performance estimates indicating a cruising speed of 240 miles an hour at 20,000 feet, while also carrying 40 first-class passengers, though it wouldn't be until September 1945 that the Ministry of Aircraft Production placed an order for two examples of what were now dubbed the Ambassador. The initial prototype, Golf Alpha Golf Uniform Alpha, undertook its maiden flight from Christchurch in July 1947, with George Errington, Airspeed's chief test pilot, and flight engineer John Pear at the controls, the 45-minute sortie being completed without much incident, although a spring tab became detached from the rudder and there was a partial electrical system failure towards the end. As the flight test program proceeded, a number of problems emerged, chiefly involving the primary flight controls, which required further development, and the generally underperforming ailerons, though despite these issues, the Ambassador was a comparatively easy aircraft to fly, and on single engine operation was controllable down to 125 miles an hour. Less successful, though, were its commercial prospects, as even after its appearance at the Society of British Aircraft Constructors display at Radlett in 1948, no production orders had been garnered from prospective customers, while its woes were further added to when the prototype was damaged following partial undercarriage failure. The second prototype, Golf Alpha Kilo Romeo Delta, followed the first into the sky in August 1948, though by this point its hopes had shifted thanks to an order for 20 units by nationalised domestic carrier British European Airways or BEA, though this created problems between the Ambassador and its own stablemate in the Brabazon Committee, the Vickers VC-2, later dubbed the Viscount. Initially, the Type 2 specification had been considered solely as a turboprop concept, utilising the latest technology to create a highly efficient and supremely fast machine that far outstripped the performance of the Douglas DC-3, thus spawning the Vickers VC-2, originally known as the Viceroy. However, as certain influential figures in the committee were not convinced by turboprop technology, a lack of consensus led to the Type 2 specification being split, with Type 2A being the piston-powered ambassador, while the Type 2B would become the Viceroy rendering the Ambassador's existence as essentially the product of a compromise. Nevertheless, its far more conventional underpinnings meant it was able to enter flight over a year prior to the VC-2, thus leaving BEA divided between the two types, with Managing Director Peter Maysfield preferring the turboprop, but regarded its Rolls-Royce Dart power plant as a high-risk engine. 
Maysfield would subsequently procure the ambassador for BEA as a means of insurance, despite being well aware of the fact that it was louder, more uncomfortable, and 100 miles an hour slower than the upcoming VC-2. Major problems with the Dart brought the VC-2 to the brink of cancellation, but through perseverance, the engine started to justify its initial promise, while at the same time the ambassador was facing trouble as well, this being caused primarily by its relatively unconventional wing. Having been designed to induce laminar flow characteristics, the wing was found to lack the strength required, while undertaking a full redesign was far from straightforward, and thus required the assistance of de Havilland, just as their Comet jet airliner was being readied for its maiden flight, meaning the ambassador's rectification works had to be delayed until 1949. This allowed the turboprop to catch up, and in August 1950, the prototype VC-2, now known as the Viscount 630, was loaned to BEA, making history as the world's first turbine-powered airliner to enter scheduled passenger service, this being followed by a series of trial revenue flights to Paris and Edinburgh. This exceptional performance convinced BEA that the Viscount was truly the future for domestic air travel, and although they had reservations as to the size of the original Viscount 630, which only featured 24 seats, improvements to the Dart engine enabled Vickers to produce the 47-seat 700 series, of which 20 were ordered by the British carrier. Meanwhile, with the Ambassador, its original entry into service with the 1951 BEA summer timetable was missed, although despite no aircraft having formally been received by the airline, Golf Alpha Lima Zulu November had been furnished with 47 seats, and was loaned to BEA for operating experience with the type. In September of the same year, it replaced Vickers Vikings on some rotations between Northolt and Paris, and during the next six months, various other examples appeared in BEA livery, ambassador routings being advertised in the timetable as operating from London's Heathrow Airport, but when Vikings were used instead, the passengers had to be bussed to Northolt Aerodrome. However, hampering the ambassador further was the full absorption of the Airspeed Company into the ranks of de Havilland during 1951 after which the aircraft builder chose to axe the ambassador scheme so as to allocate as many resources as possible into the Comet Jet airliner, despite the fact that Airspeed's sales director was just about to sign off on an order for 12 units to Trans-Australia Airlines. Airspeed's former production facilities were thus turned over to the building of fighters, while further ambassador variants, including dedicated freighters and military transport models, one of which included a rear-loading ramp and turboprop engines, never progressed beyond the drawing board. Regardless of its delayed entry into service and behind-the-scenes problems, the Ambassador constituted BEA's largest, most powerful and most comfortable aircraft, and thus the high-end cabin experience of these airliners was christened Elizabethan class in honour of the new monarch, with each unit being named after famous figures of the first Elizabethan age. The Ambassador sported an unusual Pullman-style compartment in the centre section under the wing, with the seats facing each other across tables, two on the starboard side and three on the port, while the first 18 seats were arranged in rearward-facing rows, with the remainder facing forward. BEA, by the end of March 1952, having taken delivery of six examples, which were put to work on proving flights to most European capitals. Scheduled service ultimately began during the same month, with Golf Alpha Lima Zulu Sierra inaugurating a twice-daily flight between London and Paris, followed in April by a London to Milan and a London to Vienna connection, the ambassadors offering a substantial reduction in journey times over the Vikings, being able to operate to Milan in only two hours and one hour twenty minutes to Vienna, while passengers could also enjoy the uncluttered view afforded by the large windows and high wing. In June 1952, the Silver Wing service to Paris commenced, reviving the pre-war Imperial Airways luxury lunchtime flights, with ambassadors on this route being of an all-first-class configuration, with only 40 seats included. Furthermore, the Silver Wing service was deliberately operated at half speed, so as to allow passengers to eat their scotch salmon, lamb cutlets, cape pears in port wine, and champagne, extending the journey time on the London to Paris run to one hour and 20 minutes. Adding further to the first-class experience was the special Silver Wing coach, that carried passengers from Kensington Terminal in central London to the terminal at Heathrow, and the aircraft received a personal salute from the BEA senior traffic officer upon pushback from the gate, the return fare on the Silver Wing service being £15.95 or £381 in 2023, as compared with the £11.70 tourist class fare. 
Ambassadors saw further work on London Copenhagen Stockholm services from October 1952 and undertook their first royal flight the following month when Golf Alpha Mike Alpha Bravo carried the Duke of Edinburgh from London to Malta, the same aircraft providing the return working in December, calling at Rome to pick up the Duchess of Kent. Against his initial concerns, Maysfield was pleased with the performance of the ambassadors, contented in the performance and reliability of the relatively untried sleeve valve Centurus engines, but took issue with the quality of the aircraft's electrical systems. By the end of 1953, ambassadors were operating a widespread series of first-class operations between London and various European capitals, and from January 1954, the new timetable saw the Silver Wing offered for both Paris and Nice the former costing £16 return and the latter £40 return, followed by the addition of a third silver wing run to Brussels. Furthermore, the aircraft, despite being piston-powered, were by no means sluggish, with one example setting a new record in January 1953 by flying 34 passengers from London to Paris in just 46 minutes, the final ambassador being delivered to BEA in March of the same year, by which time each aircraft was logging 2,230 flying hours a year the highest utilisation in BEA's fleet. However, the long-term future for the ambassador was put into doubt only weeks after the final unit was delivered, as the first Viscount 701, with the improved engines and increased capacity, entered service, and public opinion towards this faster and smoother aircraft soon saw a new favourite emerge within the BEA fleet. As part of BEA's annual report for the 1955-1956 fiscal year, it was revealed that, of its fleet of 101 fixed-wing aircraft, only the turboprop Viscounts were making an operational profit, while the ambassadors operating the Elizabethan service were incurring losses of £558,721. Thus, during 1957, it was decided to phase out the ambassador in favour of more Viscounts, with the London to Brussels and Nice routes seeing the introduction of new turboprops from July 1st, withdrawals continuing throughout the remainder of the year until the last example, Golf Alpha Mike Alpha Foxtrot, flew the final ambassador in service with BEA from Cologne to London in June 1958. By the time of their retirement, the ambassadors had clocked up 2.43 million passengers carried and flown 31 million miles, though the aircraft weren't finished in their commercial lives, as due to their size and relatively superior performance to the DC-3, they soon found a new career in the employ of charter firms. In post-BEA service, the ambassador found use with new owners such as Autair International, BKS Air Transport and Shell Aviation, while Rolls-Royce and Napier each operated examples as engine testbeds, the largest private operator of the ambassador being Danair London, who continued to operate the type for inclusive tours until 1971. Autair and BKS each operated three examples, with BKS's fleet being converted to a higher density configuration with new lightweight seats, increasing the passenger capacity to 55, and operated scheduled services on domestic routes before being repurposed for the use of carrying racehorses. The Airspeed Ambassador would remain in service until September 28, 1971, after which the last operational unit, Golf Alpha Lima Zulu November, flew from Jersey to London Gatwick, followed by a farewell charter to Reims, while its last ever commercial use was for the carriage of a replacement BAC-111 engine to Zagreb, whereupon it was retired to the Danair maintenance base at Lasham. There it would remain until 1986, after which it was donated to the British Airliner Collection and transported by road to Duxford in Cambridgeshire, being restored and rolled out to join the other airliners of the collection in April 2013. However, another trait of the Airspeed Ambassador was its string of quite severe accidents throughout its commercial life as well as some notable near misses. The first was in August 1954, when a Silver Wing flight from London to Paris was struck mid-air by a glancing blow from an Air France DC-4, though both aircraft were able to land safely, while in November of the same year, Golf Alpha Lima Zulu Romeo lost both nose wheels after taking off from London for Amsterdam with 40 passengers aboard. Through some quick thinking by the crew, all the luggage from the front baggage compartment was moved to the rear toilet, and after circling for two hours to burn fuel, the airliner landed safely on the main wheels and nose wheel leg. The first ambassador to be lost was Golf Alpha Mike Alpha Bravo in April 1955, when after departure from Dusseldorf Airport, 
The port propeller went into reverse pitch and couldn't be feathered. Attempts to return to the field in poor visibility, leading to a missed approach, and the aircraft subsequently stalled and crashed while avoiding high-tension power cables, though thankfully with no fatalities among the 47 passengers and crew. The most notable and worst accident involving the Airspeed Ambassador took place on February 6, 1958, when Golf Alpha Lima Zulu Uniform, operating flight BE-609, ran off the end of the runway and crashed at Munich Airport, while returning the Manchester United football team from a match against Red Star Belgrade. Undertaking a refuelling stop in Munich, two takeoff attempts were aborted due to the pilot, James Thane, being unhappy with the increase in engine power, while during the third attempt, a surge in the number one engine meant that before takeoff speed could be reached, the aircraft entered an uneven area of slush on the runway, thus sending it off the end of the strip. Of the 38 passengers and six crew aboard, 21 passengers and two crew members were killed, with the German inquiry blaming Thane, who had survived the incident, for failing to ensure that the upper wing surfaces were clear of ice, though two further inquiries determined that slush on the runway had been the primary culprit, and Thane was subsequently exonerated. Another serious accident took place on July 3, 1968, when Golf Alpha Mike Alpha Delta of BKS Air Transport crashed while landing at London Heathrow during a horse transfer flight from Deauville in France, due to the failure of a flap operating rod caused by metal fatigue, thus resulting in asymmetrical lift. The ambassador, transporting eight racehorses and five grooms, attempted a go-around when the left wing dropped suddenly on landing, but during the climb the bank angle increased beyond control and the airliner fell from the sky, slicing the tail off a parked Trident airliner while also damaging a second Trident before crashing into the unfinished concourse of Terminal 1. In the devastation, six people and eight horses were killed, though thankfully, due to the Trident airliners being empty and the terminal building being unfinished, what could have been an exceptionally deadly accident was avoided. The final accident involving the Airspeed Ambassador took place on September 30th, 1968, when Golf Alpha Mike Alpha Golf of Dan Air was damaged beyond repair during a wheels-up landing at Manston Airport, but with no deaths or injuries among the passengers and crew. To summarise, the very concept of the Airspeed Ambassador was essentially as a backup for the Premier Vickers VC2 in the event that project failed to reach fruition due to its highly complex turboprop power plants, meaning that despite this aircraft being delivered regardless, it was always threatened with a fleeting service career once the Viscount had successfully entered operation. Nevertheless, during its brief six-year career with British European Airways, the Ambassador was generally considered to be the Rolls-Royce of the sky when it came to working ultra-luxury domestic services across Europe, presenting a somewhat unique Pullman-style interior tailor-made for the business travellers of the 1950s, thus being instrumental in elevating the prestige of Britain's domestic airline.